So we've seen how alleles can persist in a population if they're neutral, because they're hidden from selection. We can also see them if they're recessive, and once they become sufficiently rare, they're only found in the heterozygote form, which again hides them from natural selection. But now I want to turn to the possibility that there are many circumstances where selection can actually favor genetic variation. The real advantage is to being different from others or to have a combination of genes. So let's first look at what are called balanced polymorphisms. And a polymorphism means alternative forms. And in this, the polymorphism refers to these alternative alleles. So we have a balanced polymorphism through what's known as heterozygote advantage. So we've seen this example before, where you have the normal hemoglobin that has the hockey puck shaped red cells, and then you have this point mutation here, and you have then the sickle shelt red blood cell. So again, this is a single locus trait. There turn out to only be two alternative alleles, the normal and the sickled. And this is bad, and this is okay. And remember, there are all these problems from sickle cell. This is with a classic case of pleiotropy. That one point mutation can affect heart, lungs, muscle, brains, kidneys, bad thing. But we're looking at sickle cell anemia because it provides the classic example of what's called heterozygote advantage. Let's compare relative fitness of the three different genotypes. In this case, capital A is going to be A for healthy uh, alleles. You don't get the sickling. And little s is the sickling allele. Now, in most parts of the world, the healthiest genotype is homozygote double A, okay? And it's a terrible disadvantage from having two copies of the sickling allele. So homozygous for sickling, they get the full-blown sickle cell anemia, and they only have 20% the average reproductive success of normal genotypes, okay? The heterozygote is pretty close to normal. It's a slight difference. But the big, big difference is between the sickling and the other two. Now, this turns out to be true only in certain parts of the world, and this is where there's not malaria. Malaria is a plague of mankind. It's a disease found in all the tropical regions of Asia, Africa, and Latin America. If we look at the distribution of malaria in the old world, it's in areas with lots of rainfall, very good climate so that mosquitoes can breed. And this area sets up a different selection regime for the sickle cell trait. If we look in the malaria zone, then we find that it's the heterozygote that is the healthiest. Being heterozygous for the sickle cell trait confers resistance against malaria. The sickling trait, if you're homozygous for it, is still tragic because there's still all those problems with the kidneys and heart and brain and everything. But because malaria is such a profound health impact, the so-called healthy genotype only has about 80% of the reproductive success compared to those who are heterozygote. So this is classic heterozygote advantage. Consequently, because of this strong advantage, the heterozygote advantage, what we find is the frequency of the sickle cell allele is far higher in these malaria zones than in other parts of the world. The sickle cell allele is unknown in Europe, North America, except for people who've recently moved here from Africa. But in Africa, parts of South Asia, these are people who have been exposed to malaria for generation after generation. The advantage of having one copy of this sickling allele is so strong that the gene frequency is between 1 and 20 percent. And these coastal areas with the most intense exposure to malaria have the highest gene frequency for the sickle cell allele. So, in a severe malarial area, you have the normal genotype, you have the heterozygote, and then you have sickle cell anemia. There's a disadvantage to being either extreme. So, strong selection
favoring heterozygotes maintains coexistence of the two alleles in Africa and South Asia. The S allele could never go to 100% because once it's too common, too many offspring would be homozygous for the sickling and have the terrible anemia. So this maintains the sickling allele at between 10 to 20% in areas with high degree of malaria. Now let's go back to cystic fibrosis. I gave this as a, a, a tragic example of an inherited disease, which is a lethal recessive. It turns out that that too has a fairly interesting geographical distribution. The recessive allele is present in about 2% of Europeans. And according to the modeling of population genetics, 2% is actually too high to be due just to mutation. It turns out if you look at this allele that causes cystic fibrosis, it's a very characteristic mutation. It's called Delta F508. And it appeared within the European population about a thousand years ago. And it seems to confer an advantage against infection by tuberculosis. Again, with a heterozygote advantage. So any individual that possesses just one copy of this Delta F mutation is a heterozygote for that trait, and they're less likely to get sick from tuberculosis. Now, this is important because Europe, unlike the rest of the world, had a horrible plague of tuberculosis back in about the year 1600, all the way up to the year 1900. And so very many famous sensitive artists like the poet John Keats or the composer Frederick Chopin or the author Charlotte Bronte, they all died and they died quite young from tuberculosis. So you have very high selection pressure caused by a disease and here is an allele, the Delta F508 allele, which is tragic if it's homozygote, it causes cystic fibrosis, but an individual just had one copy of it, had lower mortality, and so the allele could persist at 2%, which is actually a bit higher than we'd expect from any other form. There must have been some sort of balanced polymorphism that maintained this allele in the population. So this is further confirmed as having a link with tuberculosis because both the allele and the exposure to TB is nowhere near as common in Asia or Latin America or Africa. This is something only found in Europeans, and it's only the European population that was exposed to this terrible scourge of tuberculosis on such a large scale. Now, another way that we can get stabilizing selection is if we have a series of quantitative traits, um, like those influencing birth weight. And so we have an optimal size. If a child is too heavy, then it's much more likely to die in childbirth. So here's the mortality rate on the right with these black dots in the black line. And this shows the percentage of live births that were f where the child didn't survive. If the child was 11 pounds, smaller, there's sort of the sweet spot between about six and eight pounds. And then babies that were too small, again, are very unlikely to survive. So we have selection here against very small body size or very large body size. And ta-da, not very surprising then to see that the most common birth weight is in that safe range where mortality is the lowest. So most children have more or less the ideal size. It's something in the middle, not too big, not too small. And this is a quantitative trait. And with these quantitative traits, you have multiple loci. Each allele has incomplete dominance. And so if you have a middling advantage to be in that sweet spot in the middle, that will maintain the frequency of the two alternative alleles, those making things bigger versus those making things too small, to be intermediate. So that's a good example then of stabilizing selection. Now another way that we can maintain a polymorphism or alternative forms in a population is through a process known as frequency dependence. Here is a kind of goofy example, but it's fun. Here you have a fish that lives in 
one of the Great Lakes of Africa. And this is a sneaky little fish that likes to come up to the side of a much bigger fish. And it's swimming along in parallel. And then suddenly it bites a chunk out of the side of the bigger fish. Okay? And the amazing thing about this story is that this fish has a mouth that's asymmetric. And so a right mouth fish means its mouth's pointing off to the right a little bit so that it then has to swim up on the left-hand side and then it can bite quickly off to the right before the big fish gets all angry and chases it away, it can escape, okay? And then in the same population, they're left mouth fish. So there are other individuals, same population, same species, and their mouth goes off to the left, so they have to swim to the right of the big fish. They come up, take a chunk, dart off, okay? Now, this seems to be persistent in the species because if you're a big fish and you really hate it when somebody bites a chunk out of your side, that's annoying, right? And somebody's always biting you on the right side, then you're going to be ready because they've been biting me on the right side and I'll be ready to grab them, okay? But then you're expecting something on the right and somebody bites you on the left-hand side, ah, it takes you a minute before you react and they can get away. So this is where a trait has an advantage as long as it's rare. If you're the only one biting the big fish on the left-hand side, that fish isn't prepared. It's waiting to bite on the opposite side. Okay, so it gives you an extra chance to escape. And we see a similar thing like this in English gardens. Yes, in English gardens, you have these nice little lawns, nice tidy mowed lawns, green grass, and there's snails that are eating their grass because it's raining in England all the time. There's a predator of these snails, the English blackbird, okay? Now, the English blackbird is a, a sucker for snails. That's what it wants to eat more than anything else, okay? But they, too, get kind of carried away. If they first come into a garden and they're seeing a lot of yellow snails, then it turns out they get really kind of obsessed with yellow. And they're looking for yellow snails, and they get really good at finding the yellow snails. And in that situation, if there's just one brown snail, the chance is it just goes right past a brown snail to get another yellow snail, okay? So if you're rare, if you're different from everybody else, you might not get chosen by the predator. So in the next generation, now there's more brown snails because the yellow trait has been eaten out. But then the bird, it's mostly finding bird, brown snails. It's, ah, brown, brown, it must have brown, it must have brown. And it goes for brown and it may not notice the yellow. So let's go back and forth, back and forth. So let's look at what happens through time if we have a frequency dependent trait. So we'll have a simple Mendelian trait, it's a single locus trait, two alternative alleles, capital A, little a. And so let's say homozygous for capital A makes you brown, homozygous little a makes you yellow. Let's first start out the circumstance where the A allele is really common, so there's going to be a lot of these brown snails out there. Because they're so common, the birds are seeing them selectively, eating them, removing them, so an individual that's brown is going to suffer reduced reproduction, okay? So there's better success amongst the rare form, but then through time, this will now become more common so the next generation, or maybe several generations later, yellow form is now more common, but it's not going to be able to breed successfully because now the bird is focusing on the yellow. So once the capital A allele becomes rare, it has an advantage. When little a is rare, it has an advantage, okay? So what we expect to see in these sorts of things, and there are examples of this in nature, where you have an allele frequency that oscillates back and forth. So there are times that are really good to be brown, and so the brown trait becomes more common, but then it's too common, and now it's better to be yellow. Gene frequency goes back in the other direction. This goes back and forth, back and forth, forever and ever. Now, the next form of balanced polymorphism I want to show you is called disruptive selection. And this is where the extremes have higher fitness. So this is just the opposite of that birth weight one. With the birth weight example, there was a sweet middle point. Maybe seven or eight pounds do best. 
too big, too small is bad. But now we're going to see where it goes the other way around. And now the extremes have a higher fitness than the middle. So here we have our single locus trait, two alternative alleles. If the, there's incomplete dominance, so let's say this might be like a snapdragon example. So we have red flowers, white flowers. They do really, really well, but the pink flowers are doing poorly. Okay? That's in terms of what we've seen before. So we might have in our initial population a normally distributed trait around that midpoint, okay? But now we're going to see advantages to the extremes, and subsequent populations will tend to sort themselves out, and they'll be very large versus very small coexisting in the same species, or very bright or very dull, whatever these two alternatives might be. And so a classic example of this is a bird called the fire-bellied seedcracker finch, where there are some birds in this population with big, thick bills that can open tough shells of large seeds, whereas in the same population, both males and females, there are some that have very fine bills, and so they're more adept at handling very small seeds. So if the, if the food supply consists of these two very different kinds of foods, some of the population becomes specialized, like over here, for the larger seed, they have the larger trait, whereas the rest are specialized on the small seed and they have the smaller trait. That's disruptive selection.